All right, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Let me start in verse 31 here. Can you guys imagine? I know we don't have any of our college students here this morning, but many of you have been in high school. You've been in college, right? You've taken classes. Can you imagine a professor showing up to class and a professor that's announcing a test for grade that you were not prepared for, didn't know about? Maybe it was on your syllabi and you did syllabus and you just missed it. And you come to class thinking it's just a normal class and boom, you have a 70 point test essay that you were not prepared for at all. How about this? Imagine, again, we don't have our college students here today, but imagine, you know, most of us uh, are employed somewhere and, and imagine just having a presentation in some form that you had to present in front of your bosses to most of your colleagues at work that was very important, that you were surprised by, and in no way prepared for, but you found out about it that day. Those are adult nightmares. I was talking to uh, Miss, uh, you know, Aida and, and, and uh, Adina, uh, this is maybe it's VBS week, and we were talking about dreams and stuff, and Adina was like, you guys still have dreams? She was like, she was saying, like, she doesn't have dreams. Like, wow, how's that happen? And I was uh, telling them, yeah, my, my nightmares that I have are not like monsters or somebody trying to kill me or anything like that. It's like me, you know, right before somebody's supposed to preach, they can't preach or something like that. <laughs> or it's, you know, me having to have some presentation before work and I, I don't have anything prepared and I embarrass myself. Those are like things, that, you know, that I dream about sometimes. It's one thing to not have a test you prepared for or a presentation. Or maybe somebody just shows up at your house and your house is not in, 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 the right, in the right order or something like that. But it's another thing when maybe your boss or teacher lets you know that, hey, there will be random tests and presentations that you must be prepared for and that he gives you the tools to be prepared for and you're still not prepared. Jesus lets us know that in this life, we will face tribulation, period, right? We will face trials, tribulations, and it will come in various forms and in various, se various seasons of life. Sometimes in the form of satanic attacks. Sometimes in the form of you just having limited resources and being naturally broke or changing circumstances, right, that are difficult. No matter what comes our way, persecution or trial, we must be ready and continue to follow Jesus. Fact is, Jesus warns us that varying trials, temptations, and persecutions may come. And if we fail to take him seriously, we will often not be ready when they come our way and fall flat on our face. Jesus preps his disciples for future trouble future trials, attacks from the enemy. And we see that followers of Jesus must be prepared for various trials and continue to follow Jesus despite difficult times. Disciples of Jesus, true disciples of Jesus, must be prepared for various trials and continue to follow Jesus despite challenging times. And the first thing we see is that we must be prepared to follow Jesus when we are targeted or attacked by Satan. Look at verses 31 and 32 with me. The first couple of verses in our passage this morning. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Being prepared to continue to follow Jesus means being soberly aware, alert of Satan's desire Listen, to destroy you. Jesus addresses Peter and says, Simon, Simon. He repeats the name twice to, to stress the seriousness of what he was about to say, him, say to him. The re rep repetition also stressed the close relationship and the, affection, and the affection he had for Peter. He uses his old name, Simon. That has been changed since then to really produce humility in Peter as he was, he was way overconfident, as we will see, and he was not, not, not going to be acting like the rock of stability. Jesus says, Satan is targeting you. He wants to sift you as we, the chief enemy of God's people and his kingdom is demanding permission to come after you. You would think 
you would take that seriously, coming from Jesus, something to pay attention to. Jesus, although he addresses Peter, his warning about Satan's demand to attack is for all of them. In fact, the, the, uh, in verse 31, he says, um, uh, Satan has demanded to have you, that you is plural, meaning he said something like Simon, 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 Satan has demanded to sift all of you as wheat. Although Peter would be specially targeted, Satan's desire and ask was to sift all the disciples like wheat. The images are like somebody using a sieve or, or other sharp uh, uh, tools or devices to strike through wheat and separate the chaff. Or, you know, you, have that, you would have that shaking process in the bowl to reveal impure chaff and throw it away. Satan wants his attack to be so severe that it proves Peter and his disciples are frauds, chaff. The idea here is that Satan wanted to ruin the disciples spiritually, expose them. He wanted to destroy them to such a degree that they give up following Jesus. Similar to Satan's intention with Job, right? And wanted to prove that he wasn't really faithful. He wanted to show the disciples were chaff and fake and wanted to be allowed to tempt them in such a severe degree. And Satan knew that if he could take out Peter, it would have damaging effect on all of them. Satan would have special attention on Peter as the de facto leader of the apostles, and that, um, that's why, you know, Peter is addressed more directly here. In fact, when Jesus moves on here in verse 32 and says, I have prayed for you that your faith might not fail, and the rest of 32 is directed solely to Peter, that you become singular. Not that Jesus isn't praying for the rest, but he knows that what awaits Peter, right? And the critical role Peter would play in strengthening the disciples and establishing the church. Jesus wants Peter to realize he's praying for him because, as a leader, his fall had greater impact on the body. As I heard, and it's true, more influence you have on others, the more heavy is the pressure from Satan to target you and take you out. He knows t attacking the leader means spiritual collateral damage on their followers. He especially attacks fathers and pastors and Christian leaders with great influence and following to a great degree because the, the level of impact on the witness of Christ and on their followers if he succeeds. That is why, church, you really need to pray for your spiritual leaders in this life, right? They need God's protection. Spiritual leaders need to be prayed up and dependent upon the Lord. Satan is chomping at the bit to bring you down because of the potential domino effect on those you would influence. But do not be deceived. No matter who you are, leader or not, Satan wants to destroy you spiritually. Although Satan had special plans for the disciples, the reality of Satan wants to targeting and attack uh, the disciples of Jesus is still a reality, still a present day event. Church, Jesus warning to the disciple is still an active and sober warning to us. Listen, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. Satan wants to annihilate you spiritually, ruin you. He will be allowed to tempt you on this earth. Peter learned his lesson very well and tells his readers, remember in 1 Peter, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Satan is out here seeking who in this church he can destroy. This is not a game, folks. Satan wants to destroy you. And we fail to pray. We fail to stay in the word as if Satan's not worried about us. We live a life not dependent on God, as if Satan does not have us in, our, in his crosshairs, as if we can, we can handle him in our own strength. It is a dangerous thing to ignore or not take seriously Jesus' word here and act like it, it doesn't apply to you. He got more important people to worry about. 
Satan hates you and wants to do anything he can to deceive you, to trip you into sin, to guilt and shame you, to either sideline you or make you ineffective for Jesus and get you to walk away from your faith altogether. He loves when people don't take him seriously and, not, and are not sober and diligent because then he can creep in and attack. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. We know that, right? He's the father of lives and wants to destroy you. You must be sober, soberly aware of his attacks as a follower of Christ. Take his threat seriously, run to prayer, the word of God, and faith to Jesus to protect you from the enemy. Now, notice Satan has to request to tempt Peter and his disciples. You know, some of the translations you have says Satan has asked to... Um, you know, sift them away, or, or uh, and as we says, demanded permission. Satan still has to be allowed to tempt you. Just like with Job, God is sovereign over what he allows Satan to bring into your life. Even Satan's temptation is completely, completely under the rule and sovereignty of the Lord. So take encouragement that any temptation from the devil is allowed by God. He is in lovingly control that he might mature you so you might come out stronger for his glory on the other end. If you are truly his, Satan's temptation, even if you fail, will only cause you to be stronger as a follower of Christ, as you will see. Yes, the devil has purposes to destroy you, and we need to take that serious, but Jesus' purposes is to build you up and make you greater instrument for the gospel and God's glory. Another thing that we should take encouragement from this, text is, uh, from this text is that when Satan attacks, that Jesus is praying for us in the midst of temptation. In fact, Jesus is praying for you before, during, and after he attacks. You have complete intercession from the Son himself amidst the attacks of the enemy. So we see being prepared to keep following, being prepared for, and, uh, and uh, to keep following Jesus when attacked, by the, uh, when attacked by the enemy includes taking encouragement in the fact that Jesus is praying for you. In the midst of a sober warning, Jesus gives great encouragement. Yes, Satan is desiring to tempt and destroy you, destroy you even. In fact, Jesus will allow Satan to attack, but he says to Peter, I am praying for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, we'll be able to help your brothers and build them up. Notice the prayer for Peter. That his faith, his, his faith and belief in Christ, his hold on Christ would not fail. He did not pray that he would not fail at all. But that under Satan's attack, unlike Judas, his faith would stay intact. He knows spiritual ruin is the goal of the enemy. But he is praying that Peter would still cling to his faith despite Satan's attack. He also acknowledges, and, uh, and what he predict, uh, you know, directly predicts in verse 34, that Peter would fail, or fail temporarily. He says, when you have turned again, many when you fall down and have turned around, when you have gotten back up, yes, Satan will strike you, you will fall, but I know you will get back up and be stronger and strengthen your fellow brothers. We know from Matthew, Matthew's account, that all the disciples ran away on the night Jesus was betrayed. Peter, uh, Jesus knows that when Peter bounces back from his failure, he would be needed to strengthen and encourage the other disciples. Satan meant to destroy Peter. Peter. Jesus allows Satan's temptations to purge and humble Peter so that he might more, be more effective and dependent tool for the ministry in the future. Peter would be a lot more humble and dependent after he experienced such failure and bounced back. God does not need our sin and failure, but God, we will fail, right? You know, yes, we try to walk in vision, but we're going to fail. And God uses even the failures to shape us more into Christ's image and make us better servants of the kingdom. Fact is, though we are disciples of Jesus, until we are in glory, until Jesus comes back, we will not be perfect, period, right? There will come times when you fail the Lord. You will fall. Jesus knows this. Maybe grievously or repeatedly in a way that brings so much shame and guilt. Maybe you have been there already. 
What Jesus implicitly teaches us in this prayer is that his disciples do not let failures become final. They come back stronger. They learn from failures. They use them to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice Jesus does not say, if you turn again. When you have turned again. Meaning, yes, you may fall temporarily, but you are my disciple and you will get back up. Your failure would not be final because you are mine. I am praying for you and I will use even that attack of Satan as a tool to make you a greater instrument of the gospel. A greater trophy of the grace of God. That is the difference between the, you know, the betrayal of, of Peter and Judas. Judas is not a true disciple. So his betrayal revealed that the state of his unregenerate heart and led to his destruction. His failure was final. There was, there was guilt, but no zero repentance, showing he never was a true disciple. Peter's guilt and shame turned to repentance and running to Christ. He was restored for God's glory. Jesus keeps praying for his own. Jesus keeps his own. None of us will slip away from God's hand. Not even failure can keep you from following Jesus because you are his, and Jesus will not allow you to stay down. But those who are not followers of Christ, their eventual failure would cause them never to return to the Lord, revealing they were never his anyway. You see, church, the, the devil wants you, your sin failure, you know, your sin failure, your failure in trial to be occasion to have you sidelined, go into depression and further into sin. The devil wants to use that to make you leave the faith, to, to as Job's wife said, to curse God and die. Jesus wants you to know that he is fervently praying for you. He still loves you as much as he did before, and that the righteous man falls seven times, and guess what? He gets back up again, right? That you can be forgiven immediately and have your relationship restored with him. Jesus wants to even use the failures that you experience to make you more mature and to, uh, and to warn and encourage other believers. Your failures are not the end when Jesus is praying for you. He will use it to purge and refine you, and he still has glorious plans for you. Listen, if you have failed, do not keep the guilt or fear all bottled up that prevents you from following Jesus again. Let God use it to make you stronger and learn from it. Instead, pray and ask God, how did this happen in the first place? All right? Was I spiritually cocky, self-confident? Was I unwise? Did I not set the proper guards up? What circumstances contributed to it and make spiritual and wise adjustments? Get stronger from failure, not bitter or depressed or walking in shame that Jesus took. Use what the Lord has taught you to encourage and strengthen others. Your testimony, your bouncing back will be encouragement to others. Use what the devil tried to do to destroy you and use to build others up. Let your failures also humble you and make you less confident in the flesh and more dependent upon God and also more gracious towards others who fail, knowing that you were in the same boat or could be in the same boat if not for the grace of God. Nothing like failure to humble us and make us more gracious towards others. And God used it that way in Peter's life, and he often uses our failures in a similar fashion. Jesus is praying for you. Let your trials and failures make you more of a trophy of his grace and an instrument of encouragement to others. Again, the larger encouraging point here that was just so encouraging to my soul as I was preparing for this, and even this morning as I was praying, is that Jesus is praying for us. In the midst of trials, before and after, he, we have a Savior who does not just save us and then send us to the rules. No, he actively intercedes for us. You know Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. It says, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. We know 1 John 2 tells us that Jesus, the righteous one, is our advocate before the Father. Take encouragement this morning that Jesus is at the right hand of power and he's your advocate and intercessor. 
He is a perfect and great high priest, one with, who sympathizes with your weaknesses and goes before the Father and prays for your spiritual good, for your restoration, for your empowerment. Let that energize you as you are going through tough times. No matter how much you have failed, no matter how, much, how dark a time it is, it may seem like your family and your friends have given up on you, but Jesus has not and he will not. He loves you and is interceding right now for you. Keep following Jesus. Do not let failure, no matter how bad, keep you from following Jesus. Failure does not disqualify you from being used by God in a greater way. Only failing not to get up and follow Jesus does. Get back up. Do not let the devil win a, a battle that Christ has already won for you. Keep going. So what, no matter what you have done in your past, bring it to Jesus. You are not a slave to your failures. You are a conqueror in Christ, beloved by Jesus, and there is nothing that can separate you from his love. Let your failures build you and mold you and encourage others. Jesus is praying for you, and he will never leave you no matter what you're going through and no matter what the devil brings at you. Now, the main reason the devil found occasion to attack Peter in the first place was that he was overly confident in his ability to follow Christ, no matter, uh, no matter what. Right? His confidence was not on Jesus to keep him, but was on his own self to never give up on Jesus. And we see that staying prepared and following Jesus while, t while targeted by Satan means resisting self-righteous confidence in the flesh. Look at verses 33 and 34 with me. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me, so you deny, till you deny three times that you know me. So staying prepared and following Jesus while targeted by Satan means resisting self-righteous confidence in the flesh. Peter was blinded by self-confidence in the flesh. That he would always choose to remain at Jesus' side. He had a self-righteous confidence that there's nothing in life or that the devil can throw at him that would cause him to ever leave Jesus' side. Notice he uses these extreme examples of death and prison. Not even prison or death can stop me from following you, Jesus. And yet the fragility of his resolve was revealed after uh, Jesus is betrayed when he snaps at a servant girl a handful of hours later who tells him, hey, you were with Jesus. Some people, even today, love to say things like, you know, I would die for Christ. I'd be willing to go to prison for Jesus. Come on, persecution, I'm ready. Be careful, folks. Self-confident, even in a righteous thing, like following Jesus at all costs, is still dangerous and a recipe for disaster. We are to put no confidence in the flesh and in our natural ability to do anything spiritual. Hopefully, all of us would depend on the grace of the Lord to be strong in the Lord when that type of temptation or persecution comes. But I think some, especially Western American Christians, are too overconfident of what they believe they'll be willing to go through for Jesus. You know, some of y'all may not be willing to read your Bible when your schedule was busy and you're talking about dying for Christ. Some have not had a gospel conversation with a lost person in a very, very long time, and you talk about being willing to go to jail or dying for Christ. How about living for Jesus? The fact is, all of us need to have a humble sense of my flesh is weak, and I need to depend on Jesus, grace and power alone to keep me under Satan's, uh, keep me uh, victorious under Satan's attack, and not my own. Last time I, I checked, my Bible still says, greater is, is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Not greater is us, greater is he, Christ, who is in us than he that is in the world. My Bible still says, be strong in the Lord, in the Lord, and the power of his might. Right? Not our own. Right? We take the shield of faith in God to quench the fiery armors of the devil. In fact, it's called the armor of God. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not from us. James tells us to submit to God first and then resist the devil and he will flee. We put no confidence in the flesh at all to cling to Christ or fight the devil. We will fail. 
Our confidence is in Christ and the power of God. The devil has no chance if we're walking in dependence on the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as you think, I can never fall to this sin or that temptation, that is when the devil knows he has you. You know, it's easy to be hard on Peter here with the confidence he affirms and, you know, and that he would go through, through Jesus, you know, cling to Jesus no matter what trial. You have to think about all that Peter went through, right? He's been, they've, they tried to stone him with, stone uh, him when he was with Jesus, you know, and they got away, you know. There's been, they've been living under threat of death for a while. So he's probably, you know, just thinking he's ready and prepared to go through anything. His self-confidence and his commitment to Jesus blinded him from taking seriously the words of Jesus. Instead of taking serious that Satan has targeted him, and there will come a time in testing, uh, of, of serious testing, he almost in righteous deflection says, Jesus, don't worry about that. I will never leave your side. Don't worry about Satan. Jesus is the one who's telling you you need to be on guard. I think uh, spiritual victory, even ministry success, and praise God for that, but it can, it can blind us to the fragility and depravity of our own hearts at times. And it only needs to be a moment. It only needs to be for a season. There are sins that we can think will never happen to me until it does. Proverbs tells us pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, says, let, him, let he that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We know Jeremiah tells us that the heart is desperately wicked. Deceitful among all things. Who can know it? Combine that to the fact with, when, you know, as I said, Peter learned his lesson when he said, the, you know, the devil's like a warring lion seeking who he, he wants to destroy. We must not let even spiritual victories and ministry success blind us that we could fall at any moment if we fail to walk in dependence on the Lord. Some of you know the experience of having great moments spiritually, great summer camp, great Sunday, you know, great gospel conversations with people. Maybe you see somebody with saved. Maybe you're seeing God work in your life for a season, and you let your guard down, and boom, spiritual fail- failure. A lesson we must learn from Peter is stay vigilant, stay humble, no matter what the Lord has done in your life. Keep staying dependent on his spirit to keep you, to protect you, to enable you to walk in victory, because it's him that keeps us and not us. Jesus then predicts, you know, Peter's future failure and predicts that he's going to deny him three times here shortly. And we're going to have a sermon on that failure later, but it's important for us to learn that Peter's failure did not come out of nowhere. He was overly confident in himself. He ignored Jesus' sober warning about the attack of Satan, that he was targeting him. Let us learn from Peter's mistakes and be aware of Satan's attack and dependent on the Lord's protection and power and not our own. So we see that we must follow Jesus when we face Satan's attacks. But there are other hard challenges that we face as we must continue to follow Jesus. One of those is when circumstances change. Financial, where we live, resources, times of peace, times of trial. You know, we must always follow Jesus no matter what's going on. Circumstances will change. And for the disciples, that, was, that change would come very soon. And how they were provided would look different once Jesus is gone. But Jesus would still provide, but just in another way. And uh, just for sake of time, next time we're going to see that we must continue to follow Jesus when circumstances change for better or for worse. I'll add this last point to the next passage here. But we're going to end it there. But remember, follow Jesus. Learn from Peter. Satan is under, is under attack, but greater is in us than he that is in the world. Stay dependent upon him. Be aware of his attack, but don't be in fear of his attack, right? We have Jesus, the victorious God on our side, and we can walk in him and stay dependent, and we will be able to walk in victory.